Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it feels a bit strange to introduce Mr. Hubert Burda here at DLD and to the DLD crowd because he is, as Steffi said, he's uh, not only the host of DLD, but also the one who envisioned DLD some 10 years ago. Um, so, nevertheless, um, it feels some, somehow strange to um, introduce the host of the party to its own party. Uh, I would like to ask you for a very, very warm applause for Mr. Hubert Borda. Today, today, we could talk with three different Mr. Bordas. The one would be the publisher, the other one would be the philanthropist, and the third one could be the author. Today, we want to talk with the author, Hubert Borda, because he wrote a book, um, and it's called Notes on the Digital Revolution, 1990 until 2015. And despite its humble title, it's quite a visionary book. Um, it's, uh, it provides a cultural, a rather cultural explanation about the web and um, the fact that the web is all, all, up to now uh, not just reflecting social reality, but like shaping social reality um, in, uh, in merely every society of this planet. H however, Mr. Buddha, why did you choose this old Gutenberg form, this, this book, in order to describe the digital revolution? Um, I just want to show before I answer, can we, can we get this? Habt ihr die Kamera da drauf? So this is the advertising slot now. Um, and then the book has more or less three parts. The first is how the media is changing. And so you see what Jeff was just speaking about the Gutenberg application. And then come the iconic turn, um, Michelangelo Leonardo. And then it goes on and with a beginning movie industry. And then I, you know, my problem at the end of the 80s, can you hear me good or, yeah? My problem was that the first changes with, um, with, towards the digital world came by reproduction in rotogravure and any kind of printing with the scanning of pictures. In 86, 83, a company in London um, came up with the scanning of pictures and you have to buy these new machines. And this led to the problems we heard. You had to dismiss many of your technicians because these scanning machines were doing their jobs. So my, uh, my approach came was in the days when I did, um, when I did a newspaper with Rupert Murdoch. And this was the machine who changed everything in printing. This box. Everything. And this was 8990. And then I, I, I sat down and I wrote every day in my diary. You see from 1990 and you see how this looks like. And um, 25 years ago, and then mm, a year ago, I thought to myself, uh, let's find out what really has changed in this time. You said, or in your book you're writing, that there is one sentence by the German philosopher Walter Benjamin um, saying that, um, I quote, when the media are changing, society is changing, or society itself is changing. Um, Inasmuch, do you think we, especially we in Germany, understand the, f the whole scope of the digital revolution? Well, we, we just heard before about the Gutenberg revolution, the, the, the disruption of the book, of the movable letters by Gutenberg led to positive and negative impacts. The negative impact will be Jeff Jarvis the same like today. War of images, 
and religious wars. With the book, with the, with the Lutheran books came the religious wars, and they killed thousands and thousands the same way like today. Same way. It was a war of images about uh, the right understanding. For the Catholic, it was imaging. For the Protestant, it was sola scriptura fecit religio. It was only on text. And this was one reason when Walter Benjamin said, when the media are changing, society changes. And in these 25 years, you could see what incredible, what an incredible power this digital revolution had in everything, especially for the journalism, for publishing, for journalism. Uh, when Google came up in the year 2003, the Frankfurter Allgemeine had on the weekend edition about 860 pages of advertising for employment, housing. L last Saturday, yesterday, it was four pages. Can you imagine the difference of, this is a difference of about more than 80 million a year. Well, you have the profit. This was 2003. Google came up and Google took away all the advertising. So, some two hours ago, here on this stage, there was this talk between um, Paul Bernard Cullen and uh, Ben Horowitz. And Ben described a, uh, a, a situation about 20 years ago when he was still at Netscape, um, when the American publishers came into his room and he explained basically what Netscape is doing to, to an American publisher audience. And they were laughing at him. Um, how were you, you're a publisher, um, how, how were the first reaction among other German publishers when you invested in, in Europe Online or when you, you basically um, uh, did that for what uh, Jeff Jarvis just called you a visionary? How did they react to you? Did they, did they, did they think you were insane or? Well, it, it, you know, if, if there was a publisher who owned more or less the media himself 100%, he was open, he understood things are changing. But if there was a family with many uh, people in the business, daughters and sons and relatives and other children, they said, oh, Mr. Burda, you are always has been very crazy. <laughs> uh, we wait and see. Are they still in business? Those from the Süddeutsche Zeitung fortunately could sell it at, at the right moment, but uh, mm, fortunately. Uh, of course, they, the Süddeutsche Zeitung is, is still in business, no doubt, but they paid a very high price, about 800 million. War, it's a lot of money. So your profession is, um, among others, to be a, a publisher. Um, this profession is, is uh, intertwined with uh, the invention of the Gutenberg printing press uh, some five or even more than 500 years ago. Um, how would you describe the profession of the publisher in the 21st century? How will it change? Well, um, those who are following the, the, the last media change, uh, I just would hold spring did two days ago. I think the wonderful move, but Stefan von Holzbrink um, built a joint venture with, um, with the uh, Reed Elsevier Group, um, Springer Science, and the publisher is a hedge fund. So there are two publishers, one hedge fund and one traditional publisher. And of course, uh, we have many examples where hedge funds were very, uh, um, very good in changing a business. So do you think this development in Germany also, that hedge funds will become publishers? Of course. I mean, Springer had General Atlantic. I mean, you, you, you will see in the next years that hedge funds are buying up. I mean, Mr. Slim, buying New York Times. <laughs> uh, our friend Bessos buying Washington Post. So you will see many changes in, in, the, in owning media. Uh, 
and the hedge funds are probably not bad because they know how to run a business. They have the best headhunters to get young, good, professional media people. And what I have seen, they, they, they have doubled and tripled their investment. And this is a, an interesting example. You just mentioned Springer Publishing House. For those of you who don't know it, it's a large German uh, publishing company based in Berlin. And, and its CEO, Matthias Döpfner, you share a lot of uh, same opinions with him, but there is one specific point where you basically agree to disagree as far, uh, that's from, from, a, from an outsider's view, it seems to be like that. Um, and that's um, the question whether people, whether customers will be willing to pay for content in the future. Matthias Döpfner says, yes, they, they will be uh, willing to pay, and you say, no, they won't. Why? Um, I, I cannot believe that the traditional media business model will exist the same way on the internet. Uh, we have s such a lot of content coming from thousands of thousands of sites that, it, that you can get your e-papers, you can sell your e-papers. I think you can sell uh, Spiegel, Focus, 60,000, up to 100,000 e-papers. This is okay. Uh, but, but more or less you pay a magazine on the web. I doubt if people pay uh, on a paywall for special content, first of all. Second, uh, advertising. When, when I started Focus Online in very early 94, 94, 95. Uh, the price for an ad advertising page of the paper was 36,000. And I believe that the price for um, the advertising on the web would be 70 or 80,000. And I, I dreamed of, you know, uh, incredible revenues. Today, the Price is about um, 600, 800 came down, and because you know there are so many possibilities, thousands and thousands of possibilities. So the the old Verlega model doesn't work on the internet, but if you look to what Bernard Kahn, the CEO of my company, has done, Xing is a very profitable model on the internet. You pay for your content, but you want to find a new job. Holiday check is an incredible, strong content because you want to book your next travel. And uh, so you have to find out where people pay on the, on the web. They pay for a lot of things. Um, holiday check, chip online, when you buy new PCs or, or anything. So. You have to find out, but the old Verlega model, I doubt, is well working with paper. We have, we have, we are doing more and more magazines, and uh, the profit rate is still double stitch. It's a very good business. It's easy. We are only three in Germany. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not a model. It's a oligopoly, and. In whole Europe, I can see five, six, not more, good publishing houses. So, and that's a very good business to do. But uh, on the web, it's another business. Speaking about your notes in the book, the, the special thing about the notes is probably not the note itself, but it's the question or the, 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 the time when you wrote them. For example, I give you an example because probably not everybody of you might have read the book already. Um, the communication highway gliedert sich in three Bereiche. The communication highway is separate in three parts. Netzwerke, software, content provider. Genau das wird unser Geschäft sein. That will be our business. Da liegt unsere Kompetenz, unser Vorsprung. There is our competence and our advance. A communication highway ohne Inhalte ist undenkbar. A communication highway without content is unthinkable. You wrote that in 1996, though, in other words, that was the same moment when Ben Horowitz was laughed at by the American publishers in his office in San Francisco. Um, since there are a lot of entrepreneurs here in the room and a lot of journalists and everybody is curious, what will you write down in your notes tonight? Um, 
Uh, I'm very, I haven't written down yesterday a lot, but I know that I'm very curious about Las Vegas, about these uh, the consumer conference, consumer tech. Uh, the next big thing is, of course, uh, the Internet of Things, and uh, you ha you have to connect concerning your home, your fridge, everything. And as we are quite strong, I don't know how many magazines we publish for food, lifestyle, fashion, so many, I don't know, 200 or 300, I don't know. But we have, what we have done in the first period was a news magazine. Now we have to think about what the Internet of Things changes for these kind of magazines. This is a, for, for us the next big thing. So, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please applause for Hubert Borda and enjoy DLD 2015. Thanks. <clears throat>